uh, depending on where you are uh, <coughs> in, uh, in, in latitude and uh, time of the year you have t you know, a few minute corrections for every one of the uh, readings to get actual solar time converted to civil time. Then you can figure out when the sun's going to set, uh, when the twilights are going to occur, they're all uh, over here, civil, nautical, and astronomical twilights. And then also, how much of a sunburn are you getting? Turns out that's really strong function about any time the uh, polar angle gets above 60 degrees. So th this one <laughs> is relevant to your hide, your skin. <laughs> and I started to get skin cancers when I was down in Brazil. That's when I invented the thing. So anyway, there's some Euler angles that really uh, uh, are helpful. And um, any questions about the... Uh... So when you were talking about how um, I guess if you had two points sliding around, you two know that they're small twisting, not, yeah. not moving in other directions. It, it, the, the motion is um, two-dimensional, or really three-dimensional, because you know you can you can point a given point somewhere and then turn it as much as you want around that, uh, you know whatever that point is. So uh, no matter you, you know if you put start them off, you know, clean, put a mark on one and a, somehow put a mark on the other. Assume you had a mark already on it when you close the ball. Okay. And then just roll it around. There's going to be a, a, a point that didn't move. It's the point that lies under the Darboux vector that you have uh, used to get to wherever you got. Can you, can you also think of this mapping S2 to S2, the uh, You mean ball? S2 uh, is probably, I think, what you would call the sphere, mm -hmm. right? So that's what you're talking about here is, is S2 to S2. Uh, that's is a mathematical one, right? Yeah. You know yeah. more jargon than I do. So I think the Darwin vector can be written as uh, as a, in, in the Frenet's array, they, they write it as the tangential and binormal component of the Frenet's right, array. Right. Frenet. Right. And they multiply by the curvature. I don't, I don't remember what the other factor is. I, I, I was, well, I was that, amazed that, because that, I saw like, yeah, huh? It, it's on a, uh, these, the, this uh, frame yeah. is on uh, an arbitrary space curve. Yeah. I, right? What, what so it has to pay attention to the first the tangent, uh -huh. then it has to look for the curvature, right? Yeah. And, and lay on that, right, to to, to, to define its, its orientation. I'm normal. I'm normal. And one yes. of the things is when you pro, uh, when you when you have the 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 curve in the sphere, I don't remember very well if you, I think it's tangential, the normal. Yes, the normal component points. Uh, no, it's the binormal, I think, points to the center. Yes, it's the binormal. It points to the center of the sphere. And then you have the tangential, which drives the, mm -hmm. the, the curve to the sphere. But that has a vector pointing to the center, if you make a projection of that curve on its on yeah. the sphere. And I think that, that's why they write it as the Darboux vector. Yeah. Hmm. Um, I can see where it would be a problem if you took a sphere mm -hmm. and you just took a meridian line that wasn't the equator, just slide the equator up to the north a little bit, mm -hmm. right? Now you have a circle, right? Mm -hmm. How's that circle going to know what kind of sphere it came off of? <laughs> it doesn't, right? You, it could be the equator of a smaller sphere, right? Yeah. Or it could be... Uh, just a, a flat circle on an infinite sphere. Yeah, right? because you can take a, Those another are another smaller meridian. Right. Uh, like in fact, you can take like it has like infinitely many meridians. Right. And that's a problem. Uh -huh. But if you if you just draw an arbitrary curve on a sphere, you'd be able to find the center. Yeah. 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 That that's a funny business. Yeah. Anything else? that you can think of before we turn the magic eye off? Or... Uh, I think I'm still a little bit confused about um, how you're moving the 
this for this favorite room, but I understand the analogy with the mm -hmm. 2D map. But if you had a map of Arkansas um, here in there. Probably field. your best way to think about it is um, suppose I bought a sphere that could, you know, leave these things room to turn, right? So I just put it around this way, right? It would be bigger than this sphere. Okay. Mm -hmm. So once you see how um, this kind of motion occurs, right? And it's slipping already, so I have to, you know, help it. Okay. But all I'm doing with this sphere, you see, which is very complicated for the Euler angles, right? That's what we were, that's what our formula is giving us, is what's the result of the Euler angles uh, given that I have this particular axis and I've turned this amount, right? This one's easy because I know that the, the, the two points that are uh, uh, the invariant points to anything I do is, is on this axis. Yeah, that makes sense. And one on the opposite side. The and there's one on the opposite side. And that's the way we're going to find eigenvectors for uh, Hamiltonians. It's what I call uh, the 60, what is it, what was that movie called, 60 Seconds and Gone? Right? Gone in 60 seconds. Yeah. <laughs> Gone in the car, stolen in 60 seconds, right? Well, I call it, you get the eigenvalues and eigenvectors in 60 seconds by just using the, what we already have. And uh, it's just saying my eigenvector has to be on that axis or against it. Spin up the axis and spin down the axis will be the eigenvectors of that evolution operator but also of the Hamiltonian that sits in the exponential of the evolution operator. So you, you get a lot of things for a price of one when you use that sort of reasoning. So um, you, then you might ask the question, well, what if I do two rotations, one which leaves the point there, and then I move this to some other place, do another one, always there will be a Darboux vector at any moment. You see, all the time while this thing is writhing and turning through whatever axis I ask it to turn, either this one or else I just simply I'll play games with the thing, uh, and um, you know, when I do this for mechanics, I, I spin that guy up and then spin that guy up, and watch the gyroscopic uh, effects. Like when I go this way, uh, the the uh, gyro wants to line up with me, uh, whatever rotation I happen to be doing. That's that's a cool thing, right? If I make it go this way, you see, uh, then when I turn that way, it lines up. You see, that's the gyro compass lining up. The way that it moves naturally is you... It, it wants to get with the rest of the universe. You see? There's a quantum wave in there that wants to get with the quantum waves that it feels, you know, in the stationary thing. So it will try to do the best it can to get the beat frequency down between its oscillation and whatever is outside that's, that's going through the, this uh, bar there, you see. So when I spin it this way, uh, it's perfectly happy to stay, but if I go this way, whoa! It, you know, it says, "I want to," you know, "I want to get with you," right? But then it gets, you know, as inertia goes past it. That's called hunting on the gyro compasses that they used to have on ships that were so fast and so good bearings that they could detect the uh, rotation of the Earth and the relative motion of the, of, uh, the, you know, the uh, boat that was riding on the Earth's uh, sea. So that is, uh, you know, uh, just a general rotation. But no matter uh, what I do to this thing, you know, turn it up or down or whatever, and as soon as I stop, as soon as it stops, somewhere there's a, and I would guess it'd be right about there, uh, where it was before if I'd started at zero, at zero, zero, zero. And that, that's kind of hard to, you know, it's not something we think about all the time, right? It doesn't, the caveman didn't have to know this in order to get dinner. Right? So it's just not part of our repertoire. Most things that rotate aren't. Unless you're a gymnast, then you start to feel, you know, what it's like to rotate. 
But um, even the gymnast has got a lot to learn. Probably couldn't do these equations. So now the, the map, the map uh, idea, right, just, I've got a map of Fayetteville. As I move, right, as I move this way, okay, there's a little point on there that's also moving, right? If I, you know, it's a really precise map, so I can see room 241 on there, right? And I now know I'm, you know, I've moved. And you can do this with your cell phone, right? Put a dot on and start moving. And it's following you, right? So that you know, that's an important topological uh, idea. The questions to ask, regardless of the operator. Right. That's right. Yeah. Orientation. Yeah. So as it is spinning with its own Stokes vector by itself, when it is in those different violent turns. Yeah. Well, the Stokes vector is always attached and sticks here. That's the spin vector. Okay, coming out of there. And it's attached, and obviously this is the only rotation I do. It's not moving. But as soon as I do that, even if it didn't uh, gyro on me, uh, I would be uh, off. Uh, there would be some other point that was now the Darboux vector. I see it. So the, the Darboux, vector. Darboux vector is always going around in a crazy way in order to find that eigenpoint of the moment. And that's what's driving the spin to move around in the first place? The spin is all over the place, right? You know, but the Darboux is, is more than, a, in some ways, would be more complicated, right? Because it's trying to find what's the eigenvector of the moment. So if you, if you put in work to move it and spin it in the beginning, as it, so it's spinning on its own axis in the beginning? Oh, if this were... Um, a ball that was in the space shuttle, just floating here, right? And I uh, gave it a spin, right, without giving a translation, which would be hard to do, okay? But then I'd have this thing spinning, okay? Well, there would be in there a um, Darvu vector uh, of the moment that stayed constant, right? Because no matter what I uh, do with my starting, okay, uh, I've got to end up with a constant Darboux vector if it's a uniform sphere, right? It's just spinning in one direction. Yeah, it'll pick an axis, right? And I, you know, if I'm good, I can, you know, do that and pretty well get it sort of, you know, about there, right? But um, where, uh, at that moment, where uh, is the Darbu vector relative to when I said, okay, let's go, right? And then I went <clears throat> like that, right? All, now the Darbu vector is crazy because it's trying to always find what rotation gets me from where it was to what it is at this moment. gives you an idea. I mean, you'd have to do our formula or, you know, do some sort of eigenvector calculation, right? At every orientation, every orientation would be different. Unless I happen to pick the point here that was going to be the permanent uh, angular velocity vector, right? If I do that, and I'm very careful and get it spinning, then no problem, because that's the point that was where it was when I started. But if I, you know, take that thing this way and just throw it, well, now there's a new point that's the Darbu uh, from the time it settled and was released, okay? Well, that's related really to that crank that you did at that moment? Yes. So you're putting work into it to give it energy to move it. You in. put so some angular momentum into like it, and if you're on the space... Yeah, if you're on the space shuttle, right, and I am here and we're both stationary, and I go like that, okay, well, I'm going to, you know, especially if I'm very light, I'm going to immediately turn, you know, right, and I could find that Darboux vector, 
that angular velocity vector. Uh, hmm. Just by waiting a little bit to make it photograph where I am, you know, and I'd have, if I didn't, you know, move, if I stayed rigid, it'd be easy to find, right? And then we'd go and we'd look at that sphere, and there'd be the Darboux vector of the moment, right? For all the moments that until it hit something, right? You can make all sorts of weird problems out of this so for both physics and mathematics. Every time that you give it a twist, as long as it immediately switches, so if it spins this way, then you immediately do that, and then the ball just instantly went this direction. Yeah. I mean, it would switch automatically from this dark region to the other. And with a sphere, you see, it, it's pretty easy because with a sphere, the inertia tensor is a unit matrix, right? Or, you know, I times the unit matrix, right? Okay. So um, the angular momentum and the angular velocity are right on top of each other. I omega. Yeah, and, and the direction, whatever the direction that it ends up with, that's the direction of the of the omega, which is the Darboux vector that you supplied when you threw it, right? And it's the one uh, divided by a very uh, huge inertia that you have for yourself, right? Well, the ball's going this way, I'm going this way very slowly. And if I threw it with some translation, of course, we're separating. So if, in, but in real time, like if you had a gyroscope, uh, I'm just trying to picture the, the case, I'm just trying to understand like if, um, if you do apply that spin, and if it takes, if it's spinning this way and you apply another spin in a different direction, mm -hmm. it will take some, realistic, like you've been saying, it takes time for it to go to the next orientation. Yeah. And, and so would the Dar Darbo vector follows that trajectory? Well, what really happens in the instant that you, between when you touch it and you let it go, you're going to be applying a torque, right? Mm -hmm. uh, torque usually N is their letter that they use, right, for torque. So N vector, okay, uh, it is equal to the, the uh, angular momentum L dot, right, derivative of the angular momentum, right, during that moment. So uh, let's say, uh, the angular momentum was zero when you started, right? Then it builds up to something as you apply the torque, right? And then you let go, whatever that final angular momentum is, you've got that in negative, right? Because you, you guys started together with no angular momentum total, right? And so I go like that, I'm going to have to, you know, turn the other way well, very slowly while well, it's spinning pretty fast. And once it's stuck, but the thing we're talking about is more complicated than that because we're trying to find the points that are the same when I got it out of the closet, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, so you know what point is still lined up with the way it was in the closet? Well, that that's changing like mad. Were there any like uh, animations or anything for that? Yeah, we've got lots of animations of this thing. And that's just something that does crazy stuff without having any torque at all applied to it. Like a simulation that has the Darwin vector and the spin vector and the frame vector? <sighs> we don't really have any animations of that. We have lots of uh, pictures of quantum, uh, what I call gyro rotors, where you put a, uh, uh, some sort of you imagine a molecule that has its own inertia, a rigid frame, and then you imagine there's something in there uh, attached to, to it that uh, uh, has a, uh, an angular momentum of its own. And then you figure out, uh, using some constant energy surfaces and stuff like that, uh, where it's going to go. You know, and it turns out that for certain cases, you can make a, a, a pretty nice model of where it's going to go. Uh, but we haven't actually made any animations of those. Usually, uh, with the molecules that you actually deal with, um, the angular momentum traces out. You can see right behind you there, the buckyball angular momentum paths are those circles. With this one? Yes. And then up above that, um, in the upper part, there's a, uh, uh, an energy surface for the SF6 and CF4 molecules. And it's, it sort of looks like a fire plug. And the topography lines of those 
I'll represent where the angular momentum vector is going in the body frame. So the angular momentum vector, of course, is fixed in the star frame, a lab frame, but um, outside, um, you know, that, that's uh, one view. But if you're riding on the molecule, uh, then you see the, uh, um, the uh, laboratory zenith processing, uh, usually around something that's almost a circle. The very outside outlines. So. Yeah, those topography lines. And then the quantum mechanics takes over by uh, making uh, resonance between every one of the topography lines that's equivalent because they have the same um, internal frequency and they resonate with all of the other ones that have the same frequency. And you get really complicated motion of the wave function of the laboratory zenith as seen by the body. <laughs> That's why I say it's so important to imagine you're the molecule. When you start thinking about what's it like on molecule, on board a molecule, right? you start thinking, wow, a lot is going on here. And then you figure out how to, how to, um, to account for it. Okay.